Okay. Okay, everyone. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, welcome to tonight's episode. Uh, hopefully, my voice is loud and clear enough. Finding the heart's rose beyond the mind's thorns. This uh, episode was, believe it or not, inspired by a random quote I, I opened. I have this roomy poetry book. Um, this was like, uh, I think last week, I just opened it lately <clears throat> and sometimes read what, what, what appears to my eyes first. And so um, I remember hearing uh, Rumi, like this, this poet has made so many unique kind of metaphors with the rose and the thorn. That I, I, I first I thought it was like one metaphor he used, but I realized he's used it in a different way. So I don't have that exact quote that I read, but I found a bunch of his other quotes. Um, <clears throat> so this is important to read, I find. Rumi says, pull the thorn of existence out of the heart. Fast. For when you do, you will see thousands of rose gardens in yourself. Rumi says, <clears throat> the rose does not care if someone calls it a thorn or jasmine. Through love, thorns become roses. So it's, it's, it's very obvious that Rumi is using this analogy as a transformation of character into, I find, uh, ex like a character in existence is finding itself as the presence of the uh, moment. So, um, I'll start off from here. In my personal life, at least, The moments that I've been listening to my, <clears throat> I've been expecting the external, uh, the world in front of my eyes <clears throat> to adjust to my, to the world behind my eyes, the world, the world I see in front of my eyes, uh, for it to adjust to the world behind my eyes. When I want the world to be my mind, you will feel like I, I've experienced thorns. When I, in some sense, allow my mind to be the world, uh, that's when the mind feels like a rose. And this thing that Rumi says is that sometimes we get so caught up in a certain viewpoint, a point of reference to ourselves, that we stop referring or having access to different versions of ourselves. Now, the self is a very important concept. It's a unique concept, con uh, concept. I find as this concept gains motion, its context changes. That means um, uh, if you're running and I ask you who you are, you'll have a different sense. Uh, and if you're still and I, uh, and I ask you who you are, you'll have a different sense, you know. So it depends on the moment, to be honest. Like right now, as I'm speaking, my body is more still than my thoughts. But there, there have been moments where... Um, my mind, uh, like right now, my mind is moving quicker than my body, but there's been moments where my body is moved quicker than my mind. And the only way that happens is when, like when the conscious mind, the conscious mind is like a child, when it can't, when it doesn't ha get what it wants, it calls its parents and its parents are the unconscious mind. So in some sense, what happens is at the edge of 
the known possibility, <clears throat> the unknown impossibility is staring at you. This is why I say we're in an era that the advanced communicators of the modern civilization require. They require to see questions have a strange, strangely a, a more unique value than answers. A question introduces another world. An answer just puts you in one more, one world. <clears throat> and an answer is, is, is too bold. It's like, uh, excuse my language, but who has the balls? <laughs> You know, in this cosmos, to say that truth is a sentence, or truth can be even put in a sentence. It's as if, like, it's another way of saying, can someone draw on a blank canvas the whole cosmos? They cannot. They can only uh, symbolically refer to it. So a lot of the things that are behind our eyes seem to be real active imagery that's moving. In front of our eyes, it, it, it can at most be a symbol. It's as if, what's wrong with that guy? And like his friend comes in and says, man, poor guy's in love. <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of people who like anytime somebody was upset, they'd be like, okay, he's either in love or he's had a bad day. <laughs> I find love is like a fire. That means when it happens, it burns you. Literally, a, a, your, an ego, a part of your ego has stopped moving in accordance to various aspects because the mind can be seen as like I'm playful with it sometimes. Sometimes my thoughts appear to me as a river, as a stream. Sometimes it appears to me as certain geometrical dynamic movements. Sometimes I can even make it more personal. That means the thoughts that I approach me, it's like, it, it's like before I speak right now, I'm seeing a, a fleet of spaceships in the sky, but they're not spaceships, they're concepts in emptiness. <clears throat> Human beings are creatures of balance. When, we, when you understand this, something profound happens. Balance means desire and fear are secondary. <clears throat> that means first find your balance, then like try to kick. Like, you know, like a martial artist has to have balance. You have to have a certainty that your left foot can maintain the movement as you, let's say, for example, kick, you know, something. <laughs> <clears throat> The world we live in, if we assume it is alive, we have to listen to it. You have to listen to the laws of nature. You have to listen to where you, your ecosystem, your ecosystem is as much as a part of your mind as your mind is a part of the ecosystem. <clears throat> Human beings, I find, are right now in a, in a sort of phase where we have to learn from action. That means it's it, it'd be nice, you know, like... Um, that philosophers could speak all day, but at some point the philosopher realizes the value of action because certain conceptual thoughts, they don't, it's like unless you do an action, the depth of the concept doesn't extend. <clears throat> that means choices must be made, and as choices are, made, are, are being made, the, uh, the moment's experience is specializing. It is being more narrowed down into a sort of subjective limit. That means it's kind of like our impression of what the world is in one moment is the container that is holding this uh, valve of experience where the water is pouring endlessly. You know, it's, it's, I playfully sometimes say it's like trying to catch a, uh, the, uh, the waterfall. It's as if somebody takes a cup <clears throat> under a waterfall and the wa cup gets full and they take the cup away and they feel they've captured the whole waterfall. You know, 
It's as if you have you have captured a certain aspect of it. So when I think about what I know as a person, as a human being, I realize that it's kind of like I have taken a certain range of data. That means as I'm speaking to you right now, there's certain things I've seen. Literally, it's as if my eyes were open in existence and existence started dancing in front of me. But it started dancing in ways where I was also part of the dance, where as the child psychology develops, what is it like after the age of 12 or 14, the child is ready to be itself to some degree. Now, it hasn't even found itself, but it's ready to be itself. You see, the issue is we are not taught in our educational system about the subjective realm, the subjective evolution. You know, I, I feel um, I, I, I didn't hear anybody speak about the subjective evolution. It was something that like I asked, like I noticed. It's, it's kind of like you you're looking at the rear wind, rear wind um, um, you kind of looking at your, let's say, right blind spot. You know, as you're driving and noticing, oh my God, you were about to turn right into a highway lane where another car was also moving into that lane. <clears throat> so it means it's a sudden, sudden thing you notice about the design. Now, the thing is, I noticed something very important. If I ask you right now, is it important to give freedom to the world? Uh, what would you say, dear listener? What would you say? Because most, most people feel it's like, okay, I can give freedom. I can live for the world. I can serve it. But what about me? <laughs> What about who I am? Shouldn't I be the king of my own kingdom? And if my kingdom is wealthy, then I give? You know, most people are thinking like this. <clears throat> They're waiting to reach perf the self to get perfected, and then the world has an opportunity to get perfected. But I realize this is going to take unnecessary time because it, it, it can never happen. In some sense, it's kind of a strange design, this human existence. We're kind of like thrown into a world as a sort of temporary creature. But this temporary creature, all its inspirations and visions are towards continuity and eternity. That means it's fine. You cannot, like so many people, you ask them, what do you think of the concept of eternity? Um, they have no, like, they, it's not real for them. And it's okay. It shouldn't be. It's not like one thought should be real to all people. It doesn't make sense. We all have so many different DNAs, kind of like how George Patton uh, has this quote where he says, if everybody is thinking the same, then nobody's thinking. <laughs> what that means is, is like there's, there's an opportunity cost to agreement and there's an opportunity cost to disagreement. Um, when I was younger, like, you know, years ago, you know, uh, I had an intense sort of, there was a weird kind of veil, veil of my own thoughts separating me from the world. That means my the opinions as a, as a child I had formulated on myself were not able, were not ones where it's, it was as if I had accepted the suffering self, but the self that didn't need to suffer was not real for me yet. You know? <clears throat> <laughs> Oh man, the suffering self and the non-suffering self. Look at where language is taking us, guys. <laughs> there has been moments where I have... Um, how can I tell you every verb in the dictionary I feel like in some sense I've experienced movement as a creature to such a degree where the movement doesn't overwhelm so what that means is if I ask you what was it like like if you remember yourself 10 years ago let's say I'll get to the shyness thing but let me let, let me just go with the stream of thought if you remember yourself 10 years ago, your biological constitution is totally different and your ideological subjective constitution is all, also different. That means who you were 10 years ago, you don't have the same body, you don't have the same ideas. Even if you think you have the same ideas, you can't because experience expands all ideology. You cannot experience something new without the overall structure of the world changing. Kind of like it's kind of dropping like... Uh, adding water to a cup, it changes the volume of the cup, you know? So it's as if the overall has been more seen, so more data has, more waves of data has hit you as a human being, so you're more, uh, let's say, refined in your vision. 
that means you could still have the same beliefs as 10 years ago, but you don't, it's like you're not the same self looking at those beliefs. So that means beliefs can remain the same, but the person is not the same. This is why they have to believe and have faith. Faith is literally like another way of saying concentrate. <clears throat> concentrate on what is real for you, you know? And believe it or not, what is real for us is where our attention goes. <clears throat> that means concentration. You, you, you understanding as a human being that the world is standing under your attention. You won't understand, like when you reach that moment, when you realize your attention is here first, then whatever is in your attention, it's an insta, what I like to say, an insta liberation. <laughs> I-N-S-T-A dash liberation. <laughs> you know, let me tell you why. Because you are realizing one way of enlightening is that external change gives you the evidence that you've changed or internal change. Now, what happens in enlightenment is that usually the person who has objective desires, you can say spirituality, spirituality, those people who feel they're on a spiritual mission, like it's, it's commendable. They are, they are more peaceful and uh, more in tune with the universe than others, but still it's kind of like you, you wanted certain objective things, you realized you couldn't get them, so now you want certain subjective things. This is why there is what's happening in the new age community is literally like belief hopping. People are hopping from one belief to another belief, never wondering who they were while life was happening. <clears throat> so how do you find out who you are? Well, I find it has to do with the lights you see yourself in. You know how we have this expression, it's like that person was in such a... <laughs> how would you say it? It's like, I looked at that situation in a different light. You know, you know how we have that? It's literally, it literally means attention has no past when it looks at something. So right now, I can look at any object. If I consider the past and future to be present generations, this object has no name. Literally, the present moment doesn't need an explanation, doesn't need the subjective imposition of an... Uh, it doesn't need additional uh, subsensory data, which I consider to be... Um, symbolism like the the like when a child learns that language like those symbols are actually images you don't understand a lot of life is just being aware of how the experience is happening now you can't contain it in language what that means is it it moves beyond the language threshold the language threshold uh in case you're a new listener i'm going to tell you it's a concept i've developed where i say uh it's literally you have an experience that you, it can't be put into words because either the words have not been invented or it is beyond the dimensional, beyond the dualistic framework. Okay, anything that goes beyond duality, it's unspeakable. That means you can't define the infinite and you can't define the empty. We can we choose them as negations of their symbols, but like we can fi approach it that way. <clears throat> but what it is, is that man's attention is tunneling through various ways that manifestation is changing, right? So I want you to see that it's kind of like we are uh, journeying through moments. You can say a person who wakes up, like what is life in a day? It's a series of uh, moments. You know, or you, you can be like, you know, <clears throat> old school and feel it's all just one moment. <laughs> Doesn't get more old school than the here and now, you know. So here's the issue. If, if there was only reality and there was no concept of an illusion, then faith would make sense then just acceptance and trust would make sense. But because our values as a civilization, as people, is an imposed subjective value in, in the world. So what I mean by that is the world was happening in a, ver in a, in a version of itself, then man, you, the human being kind of popped out, you know, the, the homo sapien kind of found its stage. <clears throat> and it became a situation where the homo sapien obviously couldn't get the whole experience of the cosmos. So it had to work with the limited data it could extract from this moving world. So that data is extracted as experience. But the issue is it's kind of like you trying to, again, like um, read all the different pages of a book at once. You know, which is impossible unless you cut all the pieces, you destroy the book and place all the pages on the table. Right. <laughs> so
So what I'm saying is due to our limitations, we cannot be 100% sure of the limitless ever. Unless we enter a state of mind where you were never limited from the beginning. You were never lost and it's like your purpose was being, moving, was the energy within every at uh, atom of your being. Do you see? It's as if like, uh, it's like, where are you placing truth? Most people place truth in the future. You know, some people place truth in the past, you know? And some people don't need to place truth. They are. They are their moment. It's simple. Life, is, life has to start from simple principles and then become more complex because man was a simpler creature. You know, is this not the case? It's as if the, the thorn evolved into the rose. You know? <laughs> what it means is that literally you as a being, I want you to imagine the sun is hitting you right now and you have a shadow. Now you can choose to look at the sun. When you look at the sun, it's, it'll be at some point kind of like the infinite meaninglessness. It's literally blinding. Like you can't, like if you stare at the sun <clears throat> more than 30 minutes, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll clap for you for you're in another universe. <laughs> you know? There are yogis. There, are, there were yogis in India where the dude didn't eat. The dude didn't, the dude didn't even go to the bathroom. The dude would just stare at the sun for like 10 minutes every day. And in doing so, of course, I, I don't know how the dude wasn't blind, but like, <laughs> but it was, it was one of those situations where it's as if the trust in any structure activates. And if your structure, your personal reality sees the blind, stop, blind spots of external reality, it doesn't mean you have to be suddenly uh, accept external. It, it's more valuable that you do something new in this world than just to make your ancestors happy by repeating what was real to them. You know, it's like I honor my ancestors, but I don't listen to them that strictly. Let me tell you why. Because their eyes could not see certain developments that are here now. That means if I choose an ancient solution for a modern time, the ancient solution could do some good, but the issue is the modern time has problems that the ancient mind could not even con conceive. Do you see? I mean, we've had certain people who've made predictions. You know, I don't want to like, <clears throat> uh, you know, disrespect Nostradamus fans, but... <laughs> But the world is, it, it, it truly changes and it's changing in ways where we feel we're a mind projecting a body when we're conscious and the free will is active. And it's kind of like in certain moments we feel we're a body howling a mind. It's as if like, if I think in like materialists by nature define free will as, as like, because if you are atoms, you're not you. Do you see? So it's easy to see that it's like, it's kind of like, imagine like how chaotic it would be if um, in order to study the hand, you had to cut the hand and put it in like an isolated place in a unique context and then conduct the experiment. The issue is it becomes lifeless. Whenever you cut something, don't expect to like, uh, don't expect uh, for there not to, not to be in some sense... Um, Sometimes I find when you cut open the atom, you are also cutting open the language. That means science <clears throat> is a method, or you can say is like the tool, the spear in the hand of, hand of the hunter-gatherer. But whatever the hunter-gatherer finds, the hunter, hunter finds, it has to bring it back to the tribe. And when it brings it back to the tribe, the, the ethos, the collective inspiration of the minds in that environment, okay, uh, how they embrace the concept is very different because it's very fascinating, guys. Just, just, just go and check it out. It's, a, it's, a, it's literally like uh, on this planet, it's like Halloween every day. You know, we're, we're dressed up in ideology though, not, not like uh, costumes. We're clothed in, in, our, in our own beliefs. How, how ridiculous is that?
Because to be honest, I there was a time like I remember I had this friend and he was unnecessarily excited about conspiracy. And I remember I asked them, why do you why do you care to see an why do you why does your mind create an enemy behind a door you can't see? You know, it it, it means like there you like certain things are objective, but what the imagination is like the the, the it's very don't you think it's a, a kind of like uh, strangely ironic that the theoretical physicist shouts shouts. <laughs> The theoretical physicist shouts at the imagination of what it considers to be an inferior mind only to realize uh, the next day the theoretical physics physicist goes to work. It has to wonder. It has to visualize. You see, the thing about imagination and reality is, is that, to be honest, reality, it's laws of nature. Not all of it is in your free will. Okay, imagination, how much of, of your imagination is in your free will? And I will tell you, don't think your, your whole imagination is just being created by your brain. I'm telling you that is, that is not, that is not, um, it's not wrong. It's just, it's not the best model. Like for, sometimes I'm not trying to change the world that's happening now. I'm just trying to say, okay, something's happening like this. What if it could happen that way? You know, instead of we, we fight the past, we have to create new dimensions where the future is standing with a different past. So it's kind of like if humanity is thinking of evolution, like think of the evolution chart and it's like a direct line, like um, uh, forward, like a linear line, a linear arrow forward time. Now I want you to imagine in every, a line is a series of dots. So imagine in every dot, there is a horizontal line. It's as if we become more interested about the parallel uh, reality rather than the future linear reality. And what that means is pretty much behind your eyes, you're seeing many versions of the moment. You don't realize this, you know, because it, you might have either pushed it into the unconscious or your consciousness is identifying with certain, with a certain shape. You know, it's as if every person's moment of experience is literally like a paintbrush with unique colors of paint on it. Okay. That means there's only two things that man has ever only been able to do in existence, either express or receive. And as expression and reception maximize, that you, you, you literally experience a moment where you give everything, that's expression. And you receive a moment where you receive everything. And then you realize the game. You realize the value system, the polarities in every moment, the good and bad constantly making you reconsider values. How does man return to nature when he is nature? You know, I find that the yogis have been saying the same thing. Every human being, pretty much all advice is one thing. <laughs> And I find that's to remember the self, you know, how many times in movies or whatever you see people like the kid doesn't know what to do. And it's like, what should I do? And the person's like, just remember yourself, be yourself, you know? <laughs> so Western society values the self. Eastern societies also value the self, but their senses of self are defined by different will. Western society, when you enter it, you have to be it's the freedom of the individual. Literally, if you want to be an individual creature in this world with, free, with a free will, Western society is like up to, up to date. But if you want not to just experience life as an individual, then you will see what the Eastern societies, uh, their attention was looking at. Because I was asking, you don't understand, it's like it's a, it's a rock. We are telling stories on it. It's a rock. It's a rock in the middle of nowhere, external, it, like that's the, that seems to be the weird thing, right? You don't know how many days I've had, I've woken up and I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. So I've opened my eyes on a pebble in the middle of nowhere and beyond the atmosphere, beyond this like strange kind of shield on the planet, you know, it, it's like 
there is endless manifestation. It's like, as I'm talking right now, do you know how many stars are dying and being born? It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, how can you see death when life is right there? It's beside it. It's dualistic. Eventually, this is why I use the concept. This is something I'm really proud of. Like, uh, <laughs> um, the pilot of consciousness is a way I acknowledge uh, the self. Pretty much the school of thought that I, um, I tend to evoke is one that I feel consciousness has a value. The ego is a technology. It also has a value. But you see in life, people either have to extremely just trust themselves, just, just only their attention. They're, like the guy wakes up, is only obsessed with himself, you know? And it could be for a good effort. Who knows? You know, I'm not, I'm not judging the consequence because I can't see that far, you know? But uh, I'm saying some people, it's like, they, it's like they ha they've had an obsession with themselves since childhood. It's literally been like they didn't get hugged enough. <laughs> you know, there should literally be hugging booths, you know? <laughs> I feel like I should probably put a picture of a rose. <laughs> Uh, up here. So just hold on, guys. Let me find one with thorns. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's like a rose is not a rose until it has thorns. to me sorry guys I'm just I'm just getting a picture and I'm gonna put it on the screen uh, and then I'll uh, get back to this just hold on okay I, I'll talk as I do this um, the pilots of consciousness it was it was a concept which it, it was so indirectly it was one of those things where um, like if I if I okay here I'll say it short I had a dream. In the dream, I hear a word. Um, that word, eventually, I ask some people, and someone brings forth the concept of a pilot to me. Now, at this point, I, I haven't reached the sort of depth that I'm kind of sharing now. <clears throat> uh, at this point, it's literally, for me, kind of like a preference list, just go with the program of uh, the behind the scenes of your mind kind of thing. Like, like I never kind of had too much of an opinion on intuition. Intuition for me was something that the moments I needed it, it appeared. The moments that I didn't need it, it wasn't something to care. Like it was, it's like life, life is not, life did not put you on earth. So your attention is always on somewhere else outside of earth. The reason I say that we have to pilot our consciousness and even build schools of advanced communication, which I playfully say the school of Athens 2.0 is literally all human beings in different environments literally just 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 having the decency to just out of their own wonder uh, create groups where in these groups people sit down and they're like okay how do you see life okay how do you see life and eventually the inner designs eventually are come come to the table do you know and then what happens is it's like the ancient greeks had such a incredible relationship with language if like in certain historic context people back in the day they spoke in verse they spoke in verse because they were life had a rhythm for them speech was the newest technology it was like the the new iphone it's like somebody who would say something it's like uh, oration you don't understand um the ancient greeks uh they understood the language was the uh, language came from the logos what that means is they, they knew that known phenomena was the movement of unknown phenomena. They, they, they innately knew that and there was an honor there. 
You see, no great lineage can continue if, if honor and remembrance aren't taught. That means you, it's like something you don't care for. It leaves your world. Uh, it just eventually leaves your world. Your attention is not on it. <clears throat> the unique situation is that um, uh, I don't like the idea of worshipping, the language worshipping that's going on in civilization. Because this language worshipping, eventually because all the beings want to, all, all human beings kind of want to comprehend the nature of their moment at least, or find some sort of uh, <clears throat> satisfactory relationship with this living world, you know? <laughs> How would I say it? When, when, when it comes to speaking about the phenomena behind the eyes, it has to, the free will has, is, is its own tour guide, you can say. So for me, I'm kind of like, let's assume everybody on this planet attained the highest intellectual position. And let's imagine, let's imagine everybody had like thousands of PhDs, you know? <laughs> Eventually, it would reach a point that there is no point keeping in circulation something that doesn't evolve. You see, evolution is the greatest value of reality. We all want, it's like you can't hold on to the past, you know. You have to realize the past is something, it's like every moment, it, that's the beauty of it. It comes and goes and therefore new, the new enters your life. So the thing is that you feel, you may feel like the thorn, your attention could go on your shadow rather than the light that is causing your shadow. But the thing is, nature is doing its thing and whether we like it or not, something happens. I don't know how to tell you, this may be for some people not enough of an explanation, but for me, it's, as, it's this simple, that I see nature move, and nature is moving before I do, before any thought I have, there's just this silent still observer of the moment. And then, it's like once you see the life in the world, you also see it in yourself. In a lot of New Age communities, there's talks about the Gaian mind. <clears throat> the Gaian mind is the, um, Gaia is the ancient Greek word for the earth. And it's, it's, it's a sort of return to the sort of feminine sensitivity of the, of the planet. Okay, that means we rediscover the creative spirit in its requirement for gentleness. So let me tell you what evolution uh, kind of led to. It led to an ability to navigate and pretty much experience different intensities of life. Till the day you, I, before you transition out of this materialistic plane, uh, it's one of those things where... I believe it or not, it's like this. Once you let go of, not let go, but just loosen your grip on certain ways the world has to be, you just automatically get, get to see it um, moving in a way where you're not familiar. And if you get scared as a being when your environment changes too quickly, 
It's like nervousness only arises because the person feels the world is happening faster than they can engage it. They feel the audience is all like listening, like 100%. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I remember I would give these PowerPoint presentations in uh, high school and I was... <laughs> I was so nervous. It was literally as if like, I'm like, what is this? Like, am I in court? Like, <laughs> my mind uh, didn't know itself. It didn't know that it, it, the free will was here. So the will of others was directing me, you know, it's um, uh, for some time. But then I realized it's like death is the greatest wake up call. It's as if when you realize okay, the physical body is temporary. It's like the evidence is all around you. People are dying every day. People are being born every day, right? So the body is, is temporary. And so I thought, what is the temporary value? All these 8 billion, let's say, beings that are kind of here and they will pass and other beings will come. What is this game of humanity? What is the point of us having access to a space that we're in for a little while and then we're gone and others come in? Right. So that when I thought about that, I'm like, OK, so it's not about like just telling people don't don't litter. It's as if you got you got to find a story where that you don't even have to say it. Some things you don't have to mention. It's as if it's implied by the importance of the attention to where this civilization is going. That means it's as if like you once you get uh, get past your own suffering, you'll be like, oh, the world is suffering. I can get rid of, you know, it becomes it's as if like it's it's the it's it's why we have empathy because we see others. And when we see others, it's as if we are seeing how our mind is making them and how they are making themselves, you know. Because if you feel you know everything about someone, I'm telling you, you, your excitement goes away. The moment you feel you know something, right? It's as if like the wonder goes, the unknown goes. It's as if you feel in that moment you explain the unknown. But I find that the superior wisdom is to realize the unknown never goes away. It's just that we, aren't, we don't know how to be content with it. So we constantly try to escape into modes of thought. Now, here comes the unique argument because I'm talking about an inner environment. People could say, hey man, the mind's not here just to kind of, we pilot our attention to the beyond. Maybe the mind is just here to attend to the survival, objective survival. It's like, let's keep, let's keep the philosophical uh, envisionment in, in the, just the material. But I'm telling you, even if we do that, it will lead. It literally, there will come a moment where it's another way of saying we're getting bored on being on this rock. So eventually pilots will be born. Literally a wave of children will be born who they, they, they care about the sky more than the earth. So what I'm saying is Elon Musk speaks about be, be, uh, the planet becoming an inter, like we, uh, for humanity becoming an interstellar civilization. That means we're go out there in the stars, as he says. Um, so what that means is we're, you're going to need pilots, don't want, wouldn't want you. <laughs> and so what the pilot is doing, he's, uh, I'm using the metaphor that the pilot is navigating a physical plane of existence. Just the same responsibility. I'm saying that if we had the same responsibility that a pilot has when he's flying a plane and everybody's there, your life would uniquely be in a, how can I tell you? It's like, there is nothing greater than a complete landing. I can tell you this. And with inner reality and ideology, the same archetype can apply. Because we have free will, we have like that's the update. If you if you don't l care about how free you are as a being, that means you literally don't care about your evolution. You know, it's as if there was a time where we couldn't even have the brain capacity to to even wonder uh, about our freedom. Do you know? So in some sense, you can't blame history because it's nature's decision. I find there is no such thing as normality. I mean, I can acknowledge like, okay, certain behaviors are, have been more, more are, are more in the proximity of our awareness, but 
there is no such thing as normality because first of all we are not even the same we, none of us have the same exact dna to even all of us see the same normality but it's also that even if there was a norm that norm is constantly updating that means what is normal now years ago wasn't normal you know even years before that there were behaviors that were not normal so what it is is based on the awareness of the being increasing there comes behavioral adjustments and so what's occurring now i find especially in um and when i say western society guys i'm saying societies that are more drawn by technology uh than by uh ethics and morality you know that means it's like freedom is more important than discipline you know but in certain cultures discipline is more important than freedom you know it's as if staying true to a certain value is more important than being free to explore the greatest value right so i, I eventually kind of realize all these different cultures and nations on the planet are different parts of a collective brain. That means if civilization was the brain of humanity, every nation, every person, a neuron. You know, it's as if when we realize this, it means that the whole brain is, it needs to have a harmony. So if we were to experience the greatest potential of the human species, just to see what it would be like. <laughs> It's like, why do you want world peace? Just to see what it would be like. After I see it, it's fine if we don't like it, you know. But it's as if you want to attempt what is possible while you're alive. You know, it's because um, this body, uh, I consider it to be a vacation for the whole cosmos. You know, it's as if there's every joy, every suffering, it's echoing in as the moment. You know, so think of it this way. If there was a fire, if there was a candle in a room, you would totally see there's a candle in the room. It would influence anybody who would enter the room. So similarly, human consciousness, you, you as a being have a presence. Now, this presence is divided between ways where if you see yourself as an individual, you're in linearized time. If you see yourself as a collective, you're actually functioning by your presence, which has nothing to do with language. It has to do with your experience. So I'm saying that as we work this technology, we're kind of like Iron Man, uh, Tony Stark, uh, going into the prototype of the Iron Man suit just to move it and see how it is. We are, our languages are like that, you know? This is why I say speech is an art form because you're painting, the evoking, you know? You're, you're out of nowhere design is being poured on the canvas. So it's, you see, it's like you can't have an explanation for an instantaneous expression. You know, there's literally no before, no after. So if the scientific mind considers that everything came from nothing and there was a big bang, it literally means nothing is your ancestor. So when you reverse engineer back into what the meaning of life is, which people have to do to live in a social system, you know, you, you can't be, live in society if you don't see a future or a past, you know, because then you're not a person because personhood has to do with certain acknowledgement of internal laws. The issue is people who are raised in these internal laws, never wondering that there are internal laws, that their attention, their attention can be in some sense present in ways that the personality could never be. I find that's the royalty of consciousness. The king that realized, the king that wanted a kingdom where every, sit, every member of the kingdom was wearing a crown. So what it means is it's kind of like, it's kind of cool. It's kind of like based on your... Um, What's the word? Knowledge has its limits, 
the unknown will become at some point un, un, uninterpretable. Attention will be left to how much free will wants to move it and how much if it doesn't move, the divine will is moving. So anytime you feel you're not here, you'll feel as if a strange oneness with the cosmos. Anytime the personality, the attention to the subjective self leaves. Okay? And there's always gaps. It's as if you can say everybody's enlightened in deep sleep. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it doesn't get better. It doesn't get more uh, um, visual than that. <laughs> There's this remarkable poet named Rumi, who, um, which I introduced to you at the beginning of this talk. Rumi says he has this like next level quote. I, I find it one of them. Like, I, I, how can I tell you? I have I have witnessed enough um, beautiful architecture of sentences that I could totally see a museum of language. I could totally see a museum of the greatest paragraphs or sentences or whatever, you know. You know, I, uh, hopefully one day I'll have the resources to bring that about. But the thing is, like, Rumi says, I died as a mineral and I became a plant. I died as a plant. And I rose to animal. He said, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's just, just. I died as a plant and I rose to animal. I died as an animal and I was man. When was I less by dying? Why should I fear death? I shall die once more as man. To soar with angels blessed. But even from angelhood I must pass on. To that which no mind has ever conceived. Do you see, do you see how, how, the, how far the ancients saw? They, they saw the edge of the world as the edge of conception. That means evolution will move towards the inconceivable. The inconceivable, at least to our subjective self, is the realm of experience. And when people talk about truth, experience is the big, most thing that people are after. It's like after you have a sort of intellectual, um, let's say philosophical kind of scholarly interest in, <clears throat> let's say, metaphysics, the psychology of the person, the, the kind of behavior of the environment, you know, you paying attention to etymology, ontology. And just pretty much how language was born in the mind of man, you know. After you have experienced words, what's going to happen? It's it's like you'll you'll get you'll get tired of being on the island of satisfactory concepts. <laughs> Do you know, it's so so in that moment it becomes something where literally you return to the unknown again. So uh, for me, it was as if I was attempting to find this sort of um, truth in my eyes, you know, and I notice everything that I find, it's as if like it suddenly turns into ashes in my hand and fades away by time. It turns into sand suddenly. And I'm being poetic here, but like what I mean by that is that literally everything that I would come to know would be literally like a piloted journey, it would be like a peak, it would literally be like the wave forming on the surface of the ocean, and then suddenly it's submerged back into the ocean, you know, 
So it was one of those one of those things where I started to realize my mind can't avoid chaos and can't avoid order because it's oscillating between different interpretations. That means I, I personally like I, I'm not a neurologist, but I'll I'll tell you this that I find that uh, uh, the left brain hemisphere uh, is has acknowledged reality as empty. The right brain hemisphere has acknowledged reality in some sense as uh, infinite. So we're oscillating between the known and the unknown. The known is leading you towards emptiness, like you realizing, okay, let's see um, what the cup looks like that's, uh, you know, holding the drink of this world, you know? If somebody asks me, is there something greater than discipline and freedom? I would say it would be discipline and freedom's child, which is vision. The word vision means now. And the word now means all the faculties of your intelligence that are active in the moment. And in at least um, how Mr. Within would tell you, I'll tell you that you can get as much enlightened from stillness and silence. Um, you can get as much enlightened from uh, movement and noise as from stillness and silence. It doesn't matter if you wonder about the world in, in a chaotic moment or an ordered moment. Anytime there is self-awareness, it's a strange moment because literally you are looking at yourself. You know, so right now you have an ability to look at objects, like look around, you see all the stuff you see, you know, that's accessible to your um, sensory vision. Now, you'll also notice that if, if you wanted to pay attention to yourself, you'll realize it, it brings you immediately to stillness because you want to see what's here. So you're kind of like holding things still to see what's here, right? The mind is taking that approach. So in that stillness, eventually, if that stillness is preserved, you just abide by your natural stillness, then you will come to a natural silence. Now, something unique happens. If you're in that natural silence, uh, silent observance for a while, uh, what happens is thoughts don't, it's like your obsessions leave. The desire and the fear don't exist anymore. You realize it is a sort of, um, it's a reaction. Okay, desire and fear are quick movements. It's as if they're both, one is instantly grabbing, the other is instantly running away. You know, fear makes you run away, desire makes you, uh, one takes, one in some sense, uh, in, in a sense kind of like runs away. <laughs> They asked Buckminster Fuller something like, I don't know, why do you invent or something? And he said, <laughs> he said, I create inventions. Like this dude was just inventing stuff endlessly, just following his kind of playful universe and just cre just landing creative uh, vision. You know, Buckminster Fuller is like, for me, he's a saint of design. He's one of the great uh, designers of this planet, you know. He says, I just create inventions until one day the need for them arises. The need for them arises. What that means is the greatest thing man can do, he will never know its consequence. Because it is for the eyes of its, uh, you know, children's children's children to the power of infinity. 
or to the power of wherever infinity ends. Myth has it infinity ends in the finite. <laughs> infinity in the finite. What is love but the horizon's vision expanding? You see, it's as if when you care for people's minds, you will understand how important it is to use the mind. So what that means is treat your mind as a sword and shield. That means your mind has an ability to enter any moment. It can be thrown in any situation, whatever chaos, whatever order. And in that moment, it can shield itself. You see, the past is a shield. That's it. It's very crucial. Some people think, like, even, uh, like, it, life is very strange in the sense that you can speak about one thing in many different concept, contexts, or you can speak in one context about many different concepts, you know. But um, what I'm trying to say is it's so important to come to peace, come to a sort of contentment with your past. Because if you are to imagine, just playfully imagine some guy stepping in, like in front of a portal, like the movie Stargate or something in front of a Stargate, the person, imagine they just put their head in the Stargate to see what's on the other side. Or let's say they go through it. They completely go through it, let's say. The person goes completely through the Stargate and eventually sees that if he doesn't come back to his world... He will be defined by that world. So the past is important to remember in any journey. Do you know? This is why the greatest motivation for the journey was to come back home. Right? So you can say that the yogis and the mystics and all those enlightened people, <laughs> all those people realize light is in their eyes. Their whole sense was in some sense returning to an ultimate state of being. But let me tell you, it's kind of hilarious because the ultimate state of being has nothing to do with, indi with individual consciousness. It's kind of like individual consciousness is like the nail, like one nail of your, of your hand and like the, hand, the whole body is out there, you know? <laughs> so it's as if, uh, maybe that was a strange example, but what I'm saying is like, I'm just trying to say the scale. I'm trying to give you a sense that it's like the big and the small, the small and the big. This keeps oscillating. At some point, you'll come into, let's say, if you've identified as the small and the big your whole life, you'll suddenly come into a moment where you're the big and the small. You know, life tends to um, shift you. Because what the unique thing is, is we are all acknowledging we're an energetic expression of intelligence. Energetic means at least like even though we might not know like there, you can't kind of put the soul on it on the table, you know. But it's one of those things where the the energy is here. We can all acknowledge energy. Like if somebody denies energy, then I, I don't know what other word I can use, you know. <laughs> so let's say we're an energetic expression. Like nobody can doubt energy. Like there there's some power source to 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 this intelligence of ours. Okay, now we conclude that the power source is from the body and we are strange, uh, we are kind of a strange design of nature because we have to go get our survival. Our survival doesn't come to us. We, it's literally because we are individual creatures, we have to adjust to the world because we're the small and the big. But the, the mind, when it becomes the big and, big and the small, this means the un, that your, all your knowledge is in, in the unknown. You know, because a person who feels they know what life means, it's kind of like, it's kind of saying like, 
by looking at uh, one tree, you've seen all trees. You know, it's a there's a there's a vastness. But as a mind, how would I say it? Let me see. Oh, here, Meister Eckhart, this Christian mystic, um, uh, Gnostic from a thousand years ago. He has this quote where he says, um, I, I feel the exact date is like a thousand years. ago, But um, he says, the same eyes that I see God are the same eyes God sees me. That prime moment of indifference because the psychology has instantly found its roots in, in, through a sort of conscious reverse engineering. And it it's pretty much means it's like the root of the complex uh, branches of knowledge. It comes down to a sort of uh, singularity of the trunk. And then as it goes into the soil, it's rooted in a totally different uh, scale that means I've I've considered not only pa parallel realities to the self subjectively, but I've also considered a sort of du uh, multi dimensionality where it's like the symmetrical opposite of myself in a parallel reality, you know. So it's as if in, in every moment you you kind of don't have an opinion on the chaos and order. So you see the chaos and order for what they are, not for, for what you want them to be. Do you see? It's honestly a mode of self-expression. That means the mind, it, we, we may not see its pure source, which is unknown, but we, may, we do see how it attempts at, at, cont at continuity. The educational system if it does not, it's kind of like strange. The political system and the educational system, they update slower than the students and the citizens. So in one way, we have to ask ourselves, well, why are we just teaching the children of the world through educational systems just about the past? That means I find schools should literally be like... Um, like unique bunkers where literally human beings enter schools to try to conceptually um, uh, unravel certain global problems. You know, I find the greatest thing that can happen to like how the educational system can evolve. First of all, it's like all these politicians saying we don't want the, our kid, you know, our kids to be on in the streets. Well, guess what? The kids are in the streets is because there's something more valuable out there than the school. So that means it's like teachers are a problem. That's one thing. But teachers are as much of a problem as the curriculum they're forced to teach. That means it's, it's like, believe it or not, that for certain teachers, I find in educational systems, it's, it's strangely like how a citizen would feel in a theocracy. But it's like a similar kind of weight on the on, on the teacher's mind in the educational system, you know. Imagine children were paid for their assignments. They all of them would stay in school. <laughs> yeah. And you know there is this possibility that because believe it or not money is a symbol of value it is a ascribed symbol of value what it means is that it's like just like how the economy's climate the, like if you treat if you see the economy as as weather you know
it's kind of like you either change with change or change changes you. And believe it or not, it's like comedians are like the saints of the modern world. <laughs> I'm not joking. I feel like in their communication, they provide freedom. Freedom of a distraction from the suffering of the self, you can say. I find it's, it's much more cooler if we see the efficient possibility than the inefficient one. That means it's like, okay, it's, 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 it's the easiest thing to set the world on fire. Did you know? But it's also the easy is not worth doing. So it's like, it's, it, they say like a building takes many years to build, but it can be demolished in a day. So we can all 8 billion creatures on this planet stop caring <laughs> for the world. Like they, that could happen, you know, we could just ignore it. Do you know, I got so fascinated when I had a dream where in the dream I could consciously move. And I've said this before that it was like, I woke up and... I realized my mind was living a life while my body was asleep, pretty much. I was living in the, as, a, as a character in my mind, in the world of my mind, uh, when I was dreaming. When I was able to consciously move in that dream. So the, the, the fact that we are conscious in the dream state, and we wake up and we're conscious in the, uh, uh, of the dream in the waking state, is a suggestion that there is a witnessing sort of uh, other that means it's like three-dimensional but we don't see the third dimension you know pretty much existence is a beautiful movement of shapes chaos and order are extracted in accordance to the personality of the person that means if you stop doing an action you'll be defined by either inaction or you'd be defined by a different action your attention has moved on uh it's kind of like Sorry, guys. Um, like I, I was thinking about something and uh, it went past the language threshold and I was just kind of like left to wonder about how I, I could communicate it. I could say this, that um, think of it this way. You, your survival depends on how, how well you study your environment. So let's say the survival of your, your mind, of your subjective self, has to do with how much you study the inner environment. Now, the inner environment is kind of like this. When you close your eyes, what do you see? You see it's like you, it's this black, black, like, you know, there's no light, like the eye, eye is closed. But if you, you see that visualization is there, that means whatever, all these words that I'm saying, they're becoming instant visualizations in your subconscious. And if you become conscious of your subconscious, the subconscious is like... It doesn't call itself the subconscious anymore. Consciousness moves it, right? So it's like any part. If you don't, if you're not responsible for your mind, um, well, guess what? You got to listen to how nature moves. But because we have free will, after four billion years, this is our gift, guys. This is our victory that we can live a conscious life. That at some point we will see the value in it is in how far we see. And it's another way of saying kind of Henry David Thoreau said, it's not what you're looking at that matters, it's what you see. 
What you see has to do with how you're present, how everything is present. So as one closes their eyes, you know, just as I'm saying these words, believe it or not, it's like after some point, there is no image. I, like, I don't need image to speak. It's like this subcon subtle subconscious knowing. It's as if you're, you kind of like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was um, young, uh, how old was I? I think 11, 12. Um, we, like my family would go on these long cottage, like our cottage was like hours away from the city in Iran. So we would, I would be in the car with just this Rubik's cube in my hand. And I remember I would play around with it. And eventually I got to a point where it was kind of like certain things that I realized worked were like accessible patterns. Uh, you know, like when you do so, try to solve a Rubik's cube for the first time, what's occurring is you're trying to find patterns that work and uh you suddenly like you like i got it was very easy for me to build two-thirds of it but then the top became very complex and i, I remember i would constantly rebuild uh, up to the two layers and eventually like i would kind of notice those four corner pieces of the top it were kind of like incredibly complex i could literally not figure out the pattern and eventually like one day, like I saw like this piece of paper that had algorithms of how to solve the Rubik's cube, like in a magazine or something, you know, and it was, it was, that was like, Oh, okay, let's see what these algorithms are. And I tried them. I tried it a couple of times and I, I noticed it's like the person who had written the algorithms hadn't even done a good job of explaining them, you know, in the sense that you should think about those last corner four pieces as if you're doing a lot of a lot of moves, a lot of a lot of repetitive moves, just to change the sides, you know. So it was kind of like you're trying to create your own algorithm. Eventually, get to a point where it becomes so complex that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You go see what others have done, you know. And so it became one of those things where it was like, uh, I the algorithm was the wheel I found. Yeah, I didn't need to re reinvent it. And so I remember I got to a, to a point where I eventually memorized the algorithms and I could just solve it. It was, it became easy once you figure it out, you know? And, uh, so, so I memorized these algorithms and at first I needed the paper in front of me and I would copy the algorithm, you know, but eventually after I, it, be, it, it was committed to memory, it became like, I didn't even think I would just stare at this Rubik's cube and my hands had this kind of like strange muscle memory. So it was like a trust in the muscle memory. So I eventually for, forgot the patterns, but anytime the Rubik's cube was in my hand, I knew that my, I, my hands had the muscle memory of just like the long hours and those drives where I would constantly try to do this. Right. Like, because it was, it, it bugged me that it was like something, it was like the Rubik's cube was taunting me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that was my rebellion against the Rubik's Cube, you know. So what I'm saying is eventually like you do find algorithms. If, if you saw mysticism, enlightenment as a Rubik's cube, I find the algorithm, you, you eventually listen to your intuition, synchronicities, all that. Uh, and, but you eventually come to a round circle. So I'm telling you all those people who actually, they wear spiritual concepts as themselves. Like in your personal reality, it's fine. But the collective reality's effort is one where it's like, of course you can, like, you know, there's in, in, in the new age community, there are people who speak about angels, for example, people who speak about, you know, different things, you know, 
but but the thing is it's like the intensity of how you approach that idea is also as important as what the idea is you could say it's even more important what that means is it's like you're holding a cup of hot tea in your hand and you're going up the stairs okay if you don't care and just go with your uh, you know just go with the you know like if you are ignorant of the design then the design becomes turbulent then you spill tea on on you know the stairs of your house <laughs> I find that um, every moment harbors a genius design. The whole notion of multidimensionality and other dimensions and other worlds is another way of saying how this world can extend. That means that it can't be multidimensional if it's all in one world. But if that one world is part of other worlds in the same kind of like space, It's kind of like you can say existence is the question of asking who planted design in space. I'm, I've written, like, it's not completed, but it's like I'm, um, it's, it's still unpublished, but it's this book I'm going to give out soon. It's called God Likes Spheres. <laughs> and uh, I'm kind of, in my own, uh, I guess, uh, way, uh, questioning why spheres why spheres you know and um, it's not as easy to have an answer to certain things that are linked with the unknown that means we can't see that far so it's kind of like the only thing that man can do is see what tools are accessible and then just advance Advancement requires trust, or another way of it saying it is faith. And faith, uh, another way of saying faith is concentration. <laughs> Literally, the attention is, in, um, is not forgetting a design. Um, behind your eyes, you are uh, dying. Dy how can I say it? You're the life of in front of your eyes once you come to peace with this you accept your moment and it's simple it's like that moment where the thorn okay it's a thorn you look at the rose okay it's a rose and it's present so the presence of life becomes something you can't discriminate against so what that means is it's kind of like the greatest conquer suddenly realizing it can't conquer time. Time is the great conquer, conquers everything, you know, and just goes forth. So in some sense, the conquer realizes because it can't conquer, it still wants to find the resolution. 
So the psychology realizes, okay, what you can't change to some degree, what, what, what else can you do? You accept. And the worst thing to do is being somewhere and not wanting to be there because then you don't care to pay, pay attention to that environment you're existing in. You know, this is why if you don't love your job, it's dangerous to do the, your job. You know, literally like it's like your care, your value of care for the activity is not there. You know what I mean? Because you want to be somewhere else, right? Attention is something that um, they should have university lectures on. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm still waiting for neurologists, you know, get on stage and explain the mystery of our attention. The mysteries. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. I feel this wouldn't be a mystery within talk if I didn't share a story, you know, like a, a finale. Here, there's this story that uh, <laughs> it's from um, this guy, this kid, like this guy is like, I don't know, let's say 30s or something. He hears that there's this um, uh, enlightened sage, this enlightened guy that lives like, you know, you know, um, away from where most of the town was. And so anyways, he finds a location and he goes and he's, he's like this guy who authentically wants to know. It's like, okay, back in the day when someone was enlightened, it was like, okay, this guy knows some has data I don't, you know. <laughs> You can say it was like the best Google result, a Google search result at that time to wonder about what is all this, you know, uh, to go to find the sage, you know. <laughs> and so anyways, this guy goes and he sees there's this kind of like very peaceful kind of guy just in a meditation position, like on a mat or somewhere like on his porch. And he's just sitting there peacefully, quiet. And he walks up and he's like, okay, okay, what should I say to this guy? <laughs> and then he goes there and he's very polite, the, the guy, and he politely says, like, hi, sir, I've heard that you're enlightened. <laughs> can, can you please tell me what's up? You know? <laughs> and there's no response. This guy is silent. This guy, it's as if it's as if this guy, this kid doesn't even know what this guy's voice is like, you know? So the kid just constantly gets to a point where he's really asking this guy and this guy's not saying anything. And he hangs around like just, you know, just, you know, stays as long as he can kind of trying to like, you know, okay, maybe I ask him tomorrow. Maybe I ask him tomorrow. Eventually like such, such a long time passes where he gets fed up. He's like, what is this man? I've been here for so long. Why don't you just say it? Like, what's wrong with you? You know, and he leaves. And the guy's quiet. <laughs> The sage is still quiet. The kid leaves and he's really angry and he says, he's kind of like says it, let's say rudely or whatever. He's like, he's like, what is this? You know, and he leaves. And the kid as he's kind of going back, you know, going back home, you know, he suddenly gets this feeling. He's like, oh shit, I still want to know. It's like, what, 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 you know, what else can I, like, you know, he feels he has to go back. And he's like, oh, and he's like, I was too rude, you know, how can I go back now? And he realized the guy doesn't speak, so he's like, okay, it's okay. <laughs> and he goes back, you know, and he goes back and um, he's, he, it's a very sincere moment. It's as if he surrendered his question and he's just simply returning, going there as himself, you know. And he goes there and he goes and by the sage and sits down like the sage. Sits down beside him like the sage. And the sage sees him 
and for the first time like smiles and speaks and says this important sentence why this ceaseless coming and going why this ceaseless coming and going why this endless from the moment you wake up your attention is being jumping from thought to thought to thought to in some sense why this ceaseless coming and going in some sense why is data being processed by this biomechanism let's say self-awareness is the evolution And self-awareness is right now, as I'm speaking, we as creatures in civilization, we're, um, we've reached uh, to the point of language. And there is much more. There's much more than us identifying as linguistic creatures. Now, the issue is how, how does the collective change? How does the whole system change? And the thing is, like, we really, again, as I said earlier, like, you can't change it. You have to add a dimension. So what that means is it's like if you want to change the world, you're being rude to at least some some someone's ancestor, you know. So you know it's it, it's it, we have to wonder about collective value, collective value, and at least we have as a civilization come up with the human declaration of uh, um, the universal human declaration of rights. Or uh, I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> the declaration of human rights, you know. So what that means is we're acknowledging certain values. That means like our appearances could be different, but our freedoms are the same. And this is so crucial because it's external freedom is internal freedom. Somebody who, who has to fight every day never gets, it's like the warrior who has to be on the battlefield every day, never gets to see what kind of uh, painting he would draw if he had a paintbrush. You see, you see the situation? You, we can't get obsessed over one storyline of a destiny of our lives. <laughs> Therefore, why the ceaseless coming and going? Why this constant thought experience of the thorn, experience of the rose, experience of the thorn, experience of the rose? And eventually... You'll realize nature is speaking to you before any linguistic technology. Before I have spoken, the world is being you. <laughs> Alan Watts has this funny thing he says. He says, like, if you were in the West, <laughs> um, you know, he says, if you were in the West, and you suddenly realized you were like you you were this god consciousness this kind of universal presence you know and you went and told people hey guys i realize i'm god you know and it's like people in western stuff would be like jesus christ this man's crazy <laughs> it's like somebody knew something about this what is this <laughs> now alan, alan watts says this is something that alan watts said that i'm saying you know <laughs> Alan Watts says now if the guy in India look at how, look at the cultural difference uh, if the guy in India suddenly went out to the streets and looked at people and said guys I realized I'm God people would be like okay like welcome to the club you know <laughs> he, like Alan Watts didn't say exactly welcome to the club but he, he said something it's like okay welcome everybody already knows do you see what I mean it's as if that that the value of that experience has has a collective position but in western society it's still an individual position right this is why it's so crucial that like i me personally my life is divided between two cultures to between me existing in two different nations you know of course i've traveled and kind of like uh you know seen various locations but it's like Whether it's China or Italy, whether it's France or Russia, whether it's whatever word we give to a of land with an identity, the moments, if you prioritize your moment of being, you will care for uh, efficient vision. I find it comes down to that. Find the efficient, efficient vision of your moment.
beyond the atmosphere and the atom's sphere. The value of the moment is defined by a expressive freedom. That means your intelligence has to do more with how you feel you can express yourself than what you know, I find, uh, at least to some degree, you know. Uh, of course, data is important. Data is kind of like what all of us are busy with as a species. People watch TV, people, you know, are online. It's as if we're like, kind of like these, these, um, <laughs> like these evolutionary apes, you know that uh, used to hold bananas, now we hold iPhones. It's so fascinating. The change is so vast. It's such, it's such on a vast, unfathomable scale that, of course, our evolution feels mysterious. <laughs> it's it, it's kind of like either man is ahead or nature is behind. Other species are behind or, you know, we're in a different world. Rumi says, uh, your task is not to seek love, but to find all the barriers you have, to break all the barriers you have built against it, something like that, you know? The self is a story of a lifetime. It's pretty much the video game of language when we try to contemplate the self or any sort of you know knowledge you can say <sighs> thanks for listening guys much fussing